So here's your advantage for being here early is uh, I'm from British Columbia. So I flew down through Vancouver to Auckland direct flight. Highly recommend it. Air New Zealand, they do it well. Uh, it's good to be back. I was actually born in New Zealand. Uh, I left when I was three. Family farms in Tauranga. I'll go visit them next week. First time in two years, oddly enough. I could have quarantined and gone in, but you know, then I wouldn't be married anymore. And that's a separate set of issues. Uh, can we switch over? There we go. So uh, what does it mean to be from British Columbia? It means I get to show you a bear picture. This is what you get for getting up early. So my house on the left, my neighbor's place on the right. In behind us is just forest. And uh, this is a Wednesday morning, about 6 a.m. or so. And that's garbage day in my neighborhood. And so this guy wanders through. Until I put the camera up, I didn't realize it because they're pretty stealthy, you know, for 200 kilos. Uh, but he's just checking to see if I put up my garbage early. Now, he's a pretty good bear, as, as uh, bears go, because if you do put your garbage out early, which will get you a fine, it's a big deal in my part of the world, uh, he'll just tip the can over, take one of the bags, go back into the forest with it, and spread it out down in there. Uh, so it's kind of like the bear takes your garbage out for you. It's not a bad deal. Uh, but it, um, we, you, know, you guys have all the spiders and snakes and scary things like that. We got bears, but bears are really, you get used to living with them. This is a comfortable cohabitation. Uh, you could smell them coming. You know what a wet dog smells like? Times 10. Yeah. You know, bears don't sneak up on you. You're like, there's a bear. <laughs> if you haven't run across me before, I make a few podcasts. Any .NET Rocks listeners? Awesome. So my friend Carl Franklin started .NET Rocks back in 2002, which is three years before the word podcast existed. And uh, he brought me on board as the co-host in 2005 at show 100. And in two weeks, we will publish show 1800. So we are persistent. And we actually recorded that 1800 episode at NDC London a couple of weeks ago on stage. I also make an IT show called Run As Radio, which I've been doing every Wednesday since April of 2007. Uh, again, persistent, so we're at 800 something of that. And for a brief interval, we, for three years, we made a show called The Tablet Show, which was when we weren't sure if .NET rocked or not. It was a dark time. And so this was our backup show. And then eventually we knew .NET rocks again, and we rolled it back in. That's how all of those happen. Uh, free to download. They're an hour to a half hour. Many of the speakers you'll see here have been on the show before. It's a, sort of a common format. We're just trying to talk to the smartest people we know about what's going on in our industry and how we can be better. And really, this talk comes from this job. I am very fortunate to be able to talk to a huge array of people pretty much all the time. Right? More or less, it's become my job to think about what we need to know in technology in the next year or so. And it's uh, William Gibson, another Vancouverite, the guy who wrote uh, Neuromancer, coined the term cyberspace while writing it on a Wedgwood typewriter, who said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And so by interviewing all these cool folks, I can often see the future bits that they're working on that are going to reach more of us. And then the challenge is sort of sorting it out. But predictions are hard, and our friend Niels Bohr said long ago, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. I'm not quite sure what else you would predict, but okay. Uh, that's the guy who came up with the atomic model. He's the reason we believe that you have a, an atom is actually a bunch of protons and neutrons in the middle with some electrons whirling around the outside. It's a lie, it's incorrect, but it's close enough for schoolwork anyway. Uh, let's set the stage. If we're going to think about the next decade of software, we've got to talk about technologies we know are already important and will continue to be important, like the cloud. The cloud has been progressing steadily. It's, these days, I think it's very hard for you as a developer to not have some thought about the cloud in any project you're working on. If you don't think about it, somebody's thinking about it for you. And so how that affects our development, we've got to talk about moving forward because it's, it's continuing. Same for the smartphone. The smartphone is the extension, the electronic extension to humanity. Like, you got to think about it broadly enough. More or less, it stopped changing substantially when the iPhone came out in 2007. You know, before that, phones were kind of cool. They had keyboards and extra antennas and, and accessories and things. And after the iPhone, they're all a slab of black glass. You're holding one right now. But what they did do was they penetrated the whole of civilization. Pretty much every adult human has some kind of smartphone today. And so we are all cyborgs. We don't generally think about it that way because science fiction tells us that cyborgs have electronics like in their head. But first, ew. And second, slows down upgrades. 
much easier to upgrade it when it's on the outside. However, the way you react when you lose your phone, like you lost your head. So yeah, it's a digital extension to ourselves. And again, it affects everything we do going forward. If you're communicating with the public, you're probably communicating with it through a phone. Most software these days has to have a thought to mobile in some ways, and it's significantly complicated everything we do. A lot of the struggles we look at coming in these next few years are the struggles we've had, which are how, how do we deal with this heterogeneous world of clients, the different kinds of phones and tablets and PCs and so forth. It's hard work. Uh, the side effect of both the cloud and data, and even the things that came before it, is the result of this huge amount of data. You can call it big data if you want, but that seems to be underplaying the truth. We have catastrophic amounts of information emitting from our lives all the time, and a non-trivial number of companies that profit from that information, mostly not us. And typically, you know, I say that to high school students all the time, if you don't pay for the product, you are the product. And that's part of our, our modern thinking, right? And these are all the trend lines. There's nothing new here. I'm describing things you expect. More compute, more devices, more data. Are you surprised? No. So let's talk about things that are gonna change in the next 10 years, the real impact, starting with Moore's Law. Now, Moore's a nice man, he's still alive, he's very elderly now. He's part of the company Intel that made the very first microprocessors in the world. And that, that was not the original product of Intel. The original product of Intel was RAM. And he actually made this observation talking about Intel manufacturing RAM. What he was really saying was, for the same amount of money, roughly every two years, we can double the number of transistors on a given piece of silicon. That's what he said. It got spun into being the law and all these other things, but it's not a law, right? Gravity's a law, it doesn't matter if you believe in it, it's going to apply to you. Moore's law is actually the effort of a tremendous number of people to advance the manufacturing processes of silicon and silicon chips. And it's running out, we're getting towards the end of it. Starting in 1970, the original microprocessor, the 4004, up until very recently, we have a very nice line going upward the whole way. Now this is because we've got a geometric progression or really an exponential progression on the left side, right? If I take away that exponential progression, the graph isn't as pretty. We get the hockey stick, right? Because the number of transistors is meaningless once you get into the multiples of the current generation. Now, there's a better way to explain Moore's Law to, to folks who aren't technological. I, I show them one of these. You ever seen one of these? What is it? Warp drive from the, from the Enterprise? No, that's this. This is a Cray XMP supercomputer circa 1985. At the time, the most powerful computer in the world. They only built a couple of hundred of them. They typically lived in universities or in government labs. They ran about 16 million US dollars back in 1985. They were pushing the technology so hard that in order to cool it, they literally emerged, submerged all the electronics in mineral oil and then had a cooling system for the mineral oil. The reason the machine is curved is to keep the wires as short as possible. The whole design was to optimize for performance. And it consumed about 200 kilowatts of power. So bring a couple of trucks worth of generators if you want to run this thing. And it kicked out about 1.9 gigaflops of processing power. Right, so a billion, two billion floating point operations per second. And at the time, this is what we used to model nuclear explosions and uh, the grand tour uh, satellite paths through the solar system. Hard problems for civilization at the time. Fast forward 26 years, 2011, the iPad 2, 800 bucks. Don't put in liquid, that's bad. Um, that's about a 25 watt hour battery on it, so it'll run for a day or two. Also, 1.9 gigaflops. Roughly the same performance as a, as a Cray supercomputer, just you play Candy Crush on it, right? Or you keep children calm with it. Here, look at this, stop yelling, right? Works remarkably well. That's Moore's Law in action, that what once was the most powerful computer on the planet is now a device we give children 26 years later. And that's not fast, that's from 2011. Like today, as uh, technological uh, fans, the most advanced or high-powered consumer electronics you could buy for processing power would be a leading-edge video card, if, if you can find one, 
right? But at, at RTX 3090, which retails for about $1,500 US or $5,000 on eBay, um, we're running about 10,000 cores. This pushes out 36 teraflops. So 18,000 times faster than that iPad for about $1,500. It also consumes about 350 watts of power, so put on a big fan. Now, and that's still consumer electronics, right? There is a, if you talk about top of the line compute in the world today, you talk about the race that's going on in supercomputers, really between China, Japan, and the US. The current leading one is Japan's Fugaku supercomputer with 7.3 million cores. Uh, last test run that broke the record was 415.5 petaflops, or 12,000 times faster than the video card, and 220 million times faster than the iPad 2 and the Cray XMP. It also consumes 30 megawatts of electricity, so bring your own nuclear reactor, uh, and costs about a billion bucks. What do you do with these things? They're supercomputers. So there's a certain, certain class of problem that actually utilizes machines particularly well. Analyzing the tracks of typhoons has gotten very good in the recent years. It's these machines, because they can model the environment, the uh, atmospheric behavior so well, they're pretty good at calculating strength and direction of typhoons. Uh, this is also the kinds of machines that are used to build modern aircraft airfoils. So the 777X, their supercritical airfoil, was modeled on a supercomputer to figure out the optimal airfoil designs. So there are certain classes of problems that make sense for these machines, but they also give us a high watermark. Is, are we gonna have 400 petaflops of processing power in the iPad 47? I don't know, it's a good question, right? We're gonna keep shrinking down that way. But we do know that Moore's Law is running out, right? We've been following this graph for quite some time. And in the end, what was going on with each, with each iteration, roughly in, in Intel parlance, they called it the tick-tock cycle, is on the tick, you would increase the density of the chip. And on the talk, you would improve the design of the chip to optimize for the new density. Good one. And they're struggling to do that now. And the reason is, they're running out of atoms. So this is a electron tunneling microscope image of the IBM five nanometer process. So each one of the holes you're seeing there is actually what would be a transistor, roughly five nanometers across. Now how big's a nanometer? It's a billionth of a meter, which is too small for us to even think about. The best way I know of to describe a nano anything, there would be a manometer or a nanosecond, is to think in terms of seconds. So if I ask you to wait for a one million seconds, you can try this on your children, it won't work. I want you to wait for a million seconds. How long is he, I'm gonna ask him to wait for? It's about 11 and a half days, so bring some water. If I ask you to wait for a billion seconds, I'm asking you to wait for 32 years. So a nanometer is to a meter as a second is to 32 years, right? That's how big a billion is, just because we changed a letter it's three orders of magnitude, like it's a huge problem. And the issue here is that the silicon atom itself is 111 picometers across, or roughly 0.1 nanometers. So this is another uh, tunneling microscopy image of uh, substrate. The yellow bumps are silicon, the blue holes are phosphorus. So in a, in a five nanometer process where you're down to about 45 atoms across and roughly every third atom will be phosphorus for P-type silicon, you're talking about a dozen phosphorus atoms. If anything goes wrong in here, if there's any mistake in the, in the array in any way, it doesn't work. So we're just getting so dense that we don't have enough atoms. And now we get into quantum effects. There's all kinds of problems that happen once we get down to this scale. Now, is it the end for us? Well, probably not. You know, business is still business and we have a lot of compute. You may have noticed that marketing has stopped selling computers on the basis of the number of transistors on the die or the number of gigahertz because the speed stopped going up. One of the things we found out when you get this small, if it gets too warm, it really stops working. And so as we kept trying to press the speed up, the denser chips would fail. There are opportunities to move away from silicon if you're into this space, and I am. 
you will see that Intel and others are working on things like gallium indium arsenide, which is a compound whose atom, atomic structure is quite a bit larger than silicon, but you need substantially fewer of them to make a stable bit. So it is a possibility to continue for a little while longer. But there's another side of Moore's law that we don't think about, and it's the tendency for us to not improve other things as long as we're getting more compute every two years. Like if you know there's more compute coming, you don't have a lot of obligation to optimize. You're gonna get performance for free. It used to be because you knew the CPU speed would go up, but that hasn't been true for 20 years now. And then it was as long as you could use m multiple cores, you get speed for free and we always get more cores for the same amount of money. But we're already seeing the changeover. The big one is Intel, who has struggled to ever really improve the chip design, essentially, with the x86 instruction set, is making the same chip, chip they started making in 1984. And every time they try to vary away from that, we get really angry about it because it breaks compatibility. And it turns out compatibility is more important to us than maximum performance. And so the architecture in an Intel chipset is very complex because it's been built on layer after layer for the better part of 50 years, always with the eye to maintaining compatibility. But there's another emergent, very successful chipset architecture, the ARM architecture, which Intel was originally involved in and they decided not to bother with and sold off to Texas Instruments and then it's changed a few other hands and these days lives in a bunch of different places. But simpler architectures, which means fewer compute cycles to the same workload. And now we have in the M1 chip and now the M2 chip, a processor so fast and so efficient that it can emulate an x86 faster than the x86 can. Sucks to be you. We're gonna see more of this as we stop focusing on the rapid iteration of Moore's law and start focusing on how do we actually use the compute we have in more meaningful ways to increase density, to deal with new form factors. And for us as developers, a lot of this hardware stuff we don't think about. I mean, mostly .NET developers in the room? Hands please? Oh yeah, okay, so I'm speaking to my people. Look. The underlying processors for .NET have changed every other year since 2002. New processors have been implemented and removed, so forth. There used to be an implementation for Itanium for .NET. You didn't need to know because your code compiles on demand on the processors on. That's just-in-time compilation. And now you're seeing Microsoft suddenly appearing with us to be able to build .NET on ARM. There's a great reason for that. The code was on the shelf. They'd done it before. It doesn't take very long to implement for more processors. So we are living at a time as developers where in these modern languages, relatively speaking, admittedly .NET is 20 years old, we are sufficiently abstracted from the hardware that we don't have to worry about that. We're just going to be able to expect to absorb the new hardware for the things we're currently building. On the communication side, because that's our share limiting factor, you may have noticed a bit of advertising from your local telcos talking about 5G everywhere. We pretty much have been forced to have 5G phones. No, they don't kill children or anything else, but they don't work particularly well. There's a simple rule in wireless, which is the, the higher frequency you go, the more data you can cram in a given cycle, but the less distance you can and things you can penetrate. So low frequency signal ranges like 900 megahertz come through buildings and basements just fine. High, the, oil, the frequencies in 4G that were more in the two gigahertz range had more problem penetrating buildings. 5G to get the performance figures they're advertising, the ones you don't get to experience, are 20 to 30 gigahertz frequencies and they have tough time penetrating things like leaves. <laughs> so if you have direct line of sight, to a 5G tower, and I mean literally nothing in the way, not even a cloud, you can get some stunningly good speeds. And in any other scenario, you don't. And so you'll actually, if you're in, again, if you run the right software on your phone and watch this, you will watch your phone routinely hop between your 4G and 5G antennas as you turn around in a circle because your body will block 5G signals just fine. Now, part of what the, tele, the reason they push so hard on this is that certain other entities were getting big on putting satellite communications infrastructure up. Starlink has done its thing. Anybody got Starlink down here? No? A couple? Yeah, I've got one up on, the co on my coast place, which is you know, on the ocean and kind of away from good bandwidth. It works. It's not better than gigabit fiber, but it's pretty good, and it works pretty much anywhere, more or less. Uh, 
and, but it's certainly not going to go on a cell phone. You know, the dish is still pizza-sized and uh, not particularly portable and not particularly tolerant to motion because it, it's using a continuously steered antenna inside that pizza box to track the satellites as they whiz by. Like, you don't think a lot's going on inside that, that, that plate when you watch it. It just sort of it seems like it's sitting there. That's not true. It's very, very busy thing. And so in motion, substantially harder. And uh, clearly, they've had a role to play in Ukraine. Uh, and there's been threats of other ones being built, but I'll, I'll, once people start actually flying hardware in meaningful amounts, I'll care. That and I, but I did notice that since the last time I was down here in 2019, when I flew 14 hours across the Pacific Ocean, I had free Wi-Fi the whole time. So I was text messaging about, hi, I'm in the middle Pacific, because that's hilarious to me. But, uh, you know, you're not going to watch YouTube videos doing that, but it did work. And, yeah, the current state of Starlink is, is pretty impressive. They're starting to get up. I get about 400 megabits down and 100 up at 20 nanoseconds, which is like decent cable modem speeds. And they say it'll continue. It's, I was on the original beta where it was off half the time as well and much slower. So it has steadily improved and is much more reliable. Now they're talking about putting the laser layer in. I do own the domain name Tech Billionaire or Supervillain. I'm a little afraid to actually set up the site, but really all you want is a questionnaire, right? And it's like, do you own an island? Does your island have a volcano? Do you have a, a ship so large you have to point it with, park it with oil tankers? Does it have a helicopter pad? Does it have two helicopter pads? Does it have a submarine? Does your submarine have a submarine? Do you fly lasers in space? Who's the closest to being Dr. No? It's kind of a race, it seems. But what does this mean for the next 10 years? The concept is called ubiquitous computing. Moore's law means computers keep getting smaller. I, if you've played with an ESP32, which is a very mainstream chip, I think you can buy them on Amazon now for five bucks, it'll run .NET, the size of your thumbnail. And if you're willing to go a little bit bigger than that, and it'll have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on it as well. And then you combine it with ubiquitous connectivity absolutely everywhere. We then have a choice, right? That we can have as much compute as we want. In fact, we're going to be surrounded by compute all of the time. Throw the cloud in there where you literally have compute on demand. As long as you have a device that can get out to that, you can say, hey, run this hard thing for me. Give me back the results. So the idea that we have a single personal computer, and your cell phone is your personal computer, right? I mean, what's more personal than a computer that threatens to give you cancer? Right? It's in your pocket. Goodness knows what it's doing to you. Um, we are not going to focus on one computer. Everything's going to have a computer around it all the time, and you'll just be hopefully able to use it when you need to, which really brings us to the real problem, which is identity. What's going to happen in the next 10 years of identity? Pain. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> and we'd be remiss not to talk about the pandemic. So what did the pandemic really do um, besides keep us away from each other for a couple of years? I mean, who knew a bunch of introverts would miss each other this much? I am surprised. But I missed you guys, I guarantee it. Uh, our friend Satya Nadella said that two years of cloud migration happened in two months. I do think when we go back and write the history, somewhere in, the, in April or May of 2020, was, we got very close to tipping over the internet. Like the amount of additional stress that happened on the backbones when everybody moved home and software was trying to figure out how to work remotely that wasn't designed to work remotely. You remember when the EU asked Netflix to turn off 4K mode? Like that was the hint. Hey, we kind of need that bandwidth right now. But we got through it, obviously, we got on the other side. Not that big a deal for a lot of us as developers, you know, we were doing it beforehand. Uh, other than now we saw a whole lot of people on Zoom and Teams that weren't used to being on Zoom and Teams. And so, although remember that, that actually went through a wave too. Like for a while there, the emojis and the face changing stuff was fun. And after a while, it's like, none of this is fun anymore. And then, you know, it's interesting to see the emergent etiquette. Like it's very common now. Everybody has their face on at the beginning. And then it's like, okay, well, this person's going to talk. And so we turn all the faces off because it's like you're paying attention by not paying attention. At least you're not showing them you're not paying attention. We'll call that polite. Um... But we're also seeing, not just as a, as I would largely say it's still a product of the pandemic, are the economic impacts. So the supply chain is severely disrupted. It still is severely disrupted. The ongoing lockdowns in China aren't helping either. 
it's going to take quite a while to straighten all of that out. Uh, the inflation aspects and the great resignation are all residuals of this as well. We've all had an interesting moment in our, in our way we're thinking about things. A lot of people have thought about changing careers and the stress on the infrastructure of society has been substantial. And some are taking advantage of it, some are not. There's lots of troubles here. What does that mean for us as software developers? Because we're pretty resilient, right? Our need for software isn't going away. In, the problem is that you've had more than 10 years and arguably 20 years, if you don't talk about the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, of continuous growth in technology where the job, we were going, we steadily ran at a 20% unfilled job rate. Like we had more demand for people than we could train them. If you wanted to get involved in anything, there were opportunities nonstop. And that largely still hasn't really gone away. In some ways it almost accelerated briefly there. It's like, okay, well that's maybe a little too fast and we're calming down a bit. But as someone who's written code in one form or another for more than 40 years, I have been through a couple of real recessions and I could always keep writing code because you focus on the return on investment of that code. We forget how effective our software is in making businesses efficient, because we haven't had to think about it for quite a while. But the reality is we amplify the performance of the whole company, that one person can do five times more work effectively, process invoices more effectively, you know, complete data sets more effectively. And so if your projects are focused on value for the company, their demand is only gonna go up as markets get tougher. If your product is not associated to how the company makes money, that's the one that's probably gonna get cut, right? You are gonna see folks needing to economize. But the question I ask anyone working in software is, do you know how your company makes money? Because often, it's not you. You build the tools that others in the company make money with. And that's fine, it's incredibly valuable because often when you do a good job, you make those people dramatically more efficient. Just be aware, how does this company make money? How does the project I'm working on make a difference on that? And you only become more valuable. But if you don't know that association, you're vulnerable and you might get surprised. That's the, the only thing that really changes in these markets. Okay, I've spent a good 20 minutes now setting the stage for things. Let's talk about current generation technology and how they're evolving. The browsers aren't going away. For the most part, they are the definitive smart client technology for the average company. Folks generally aren't interested in anything else most of the time. It's been true for quite a while. They've matured nicely for the most part you know, the browsers all work and play well with each other. We have finally really let IE go, although it's a lie. You know it's a lie, right? The IE rendering engine is running on a side of, inside of Edge now, if you need it. So if you're in IT and you have an app that was written for IE7, they exist, and so you have the directive that says run in IE7 mode, Edge now does that for you. What they've really done is taken away the icon. Much angst about that. But you know, that was part of the problem with IE is that it kept every previous rendering engine inside of it. That's why it got so huge. It had all the rendering engines in it. And now it's in Edge, because Edge was just not big enough. Um, the current, the new generation IE6 is Safari, right? Because it's popular and not compliant with standards. That was the problem with IE6, because it was the default browser in XP, and XP persisted for so long, and, and IE6 shipped before CSS1 was ratified, so it was wrong. You ended up in that same problem as a web developer, where you had to build a web page for all the browsers and a separate one for IE6, or you wrote a lot of if IE6 code. And today, I talk to developers saying exactly the same thing. I'm writing a lot of if Safari code. Apple's getting better, but that's the current stressor in that world. The progressive web app, I, I think we talk about it routinely on the shows. It's a good technology. I mean, it's really about making browser apps more app-like. And if that makes you happy, that's great. The question is, are you happy? You know, folks, some folks really like write, writing JavaScript so, and they're good at it or they find the tool set that makes them happy. We talked about it on the show. It's like you're in the tribe of Angular. And there's a set of libraries that work well with Angular and you're happy there and there's a certain class of products you can build for your company that are valuable that they're gonna be content with or you're in the, or the React tribe or you're in the Vue tribe or you're in that crazy vanilla JS tribe and you're just gonna write all that stuff yourself. I put Chris Love on the show every once a year or so just to remind myself there's crazy ways to do JavaScript too. 
And our friend Steve Sanderson, who I'm sad is not here, but I've seen him a few times, uh, getting that implementation of .NET through WebAssembly that eventually became Blazor. Any Blazor fans? A few. I mean, for the average corporate developer who's been maintaining web forms apps for years and years and years, this is a pretty interesting path. The biggest appeal for WebAssembly in general is I need to build a web app, but I don't want to write in JavaScript. And so I can write in C Sharp or I can write in Go. You know, and there are other implementations from there. That's the shtick on WebAssembly. Although we have a show coming up with Sanderson in the immediate future where we start thinking about the idea that a WebAssembly is actually a container and you could choose where to run it. I mean, we already do it where we run it either in the browser or run it on the server, but what if we could run it in intermediate steps in between? A little brain twisting, but I had a great time. Carl's just like, I don't know what you people are talking about, but Steve and I went off on a vendor on the network is the computer and maybe WebAssembly is the module of compute. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Web3, because if you don't do a keynote with at least one scam in it, you know, you're not doing it right. Yeah, Web3 is being talked about a lot. There's a few elements of it that I find are interesting. In general, it's the three pieces, decentralized web, blockchain, crypto, all right? I'm not talk, I don't really need to talk about NFTs too much. The one thing I think is super credible in the space of Web3 is the decentralization of the web. So after the dot-com bust at the end of 2000, 2001, where we were building a lot of our own stuff and it was up to, we had a lot of servers on the internet that were sitting under desks and then a lot of them that mysteriously went away. We recognized that running servers was hard. And so you could do it in the data center with sufficient skill sets, but for most people it ended up being, you would buy a service, right? This application service of one kind or another. The cloud would eventually emerge from this, but you think about the modern version of GeoCities, it became Facebook. We started living in this walled garden world because it was convenient, but it came at a price. That, that price largely was a complete abrogation of privacy and people exploiting your data for their profit. You were the product, not the customer. The customer was an advertiser. And so decentralized web as a movement is saying, hey, is there a way for us to resist the walled garden? Now, we're, we're not talking about putting servers back under desks again. We're really talking about running it under the cloud. And that still is a centralization of a sort, but it's a centralization where you're paying for your service and so you can have certain rights. Now, this is the battle that's going on from a regulatory effort all over the Western world and further to say, what does decentralized look like? What are the responsibilities of the cloud? The cloud is headed towards this idea of utility computing. And we've had, we've created, so civilization has created utilities for millennia. Our original utility was water. Right? When the neighborhood gets together and digs a well, utility water. When the Romans build aqueducts, utility water. Right? Then we figured out, hey, if you're gonna bring water in, you gotta take poop out, so we built sewage, same thing, another utility. We've experimented with others, but certain other ones have caught on. Electricity seems popular. Our jobs get really dull without it. Uh, and same for things like uh, internet connectivity and now cloud, compute by the minute, where you really only care about cost and immediate availability. The upside to that is consistently throughout civilization, when something becomes a utility, it becomes heavily regulated because our expectation is it just work, it has no side effects. And so you can see in the next few years, bit by bit, we will put pretty significant rules around cloud carriers. And this is the same thing that happened in telephony back in the day. When bank robbers started coordinating their bank robberies on the telephone, the telephone company was not held liable for the crime. They were the common carrier, right? The cloud's going to be able to have common carrier status. You can build a bad guy website on it, but because they, hadn't, they haven't controlled what you put on there, that's fine. Facebook can't pull that off because Facebook exploits your data to sell stuff with it, so they're editorializing your data, so they don't qualify as a common carrier, and that's why they're in trouble with most governments. Another element of, of uh, Web3 that's relevant is blockchain. The only real problem with blockchain is it's associated with crypto. I look at this the same as the association between BitTorrent and Napster back in the day. There's nothing wrong with BitTorrent except that it was contaminated with stealing music, right? Crypto is fundamentally a scam. It was born out of the frustrations of the economic decline in 2008 and 2009. Hey, if the bankers are gonna, gonna screw over the common man, well, let's make our own currencies. It's a fine idea. It's just that what you look for in a currency is fungibility, reliability, and stability. 
none of which exists inside of crypto. So it's only going to be on, it's not been having a good couple of weeks, so it's easy to feel like you're right. Doing this talk when it was at 50 gram was a little tougher. <laughs> but right now at 22, it's like, ah, oh, we're okay. But blockchain's got some good ideas. Now, distributed databases aren't for everybody, but the idea that you can feed data in, uh, by consensus into a chain of information where all parties involved don't have to be on the same page completely, like there's, there's places where that makes sense. Not a lot of them, but some. So it's clearly being overused and, and overexploited right now, but it's one of those things just like, if this interests you, keep it in your pocket. You may run across a project at some point where it'll be important and be able to consume it because as certain uh, important projects emerge with it, you'll see it being used. Uh, .NET's had a pretty good few years. I am still working on a book on the history of .NET. It may kill me. It's been a while, but uh, it's been a fun ride gathering all the stories and the detail of the transformation that .NET went through. You know, to start out as a product built to sell copies of Windows, right? It was a tool to compete with Java. They didn't want to say that back then, but that was the truth, and it's the truth now. Uh, and to, to, for enterprise developers to build internal applications, that was its job. And then the operating system became unimportant. I mean, we all need one. We don't care which one anymore. And so the idea that it was bound to any one operating system is nuts. Microsoft has done a phenomenal transformation of itself. After 30 years of being an operating system company, they are now a cloud company. And this is one of the products that led the rest of the company into you can transmute yourself into a cross-platform open source library. And so effectively, we had a reboot of .NET. It's just that we didn't have to replace the tools. And depending on what libraries you depended on, many of your apps would just simply move to the new library. If they depended on WCF, you were sadder. Right? or web forms, and you're much sadder. I am very interested in continuing to do shows uh, around Maui. And so Maui is the fruition of them trying to develop a new client-size strategy. And if you listen to Dr. Rocks, you've noticed I've been talking about client libraries nonstop. The Unos and the Avalons and like all these other techs. Uh, the OpenSilver, which is a Silverlight implementation in open source that uses WebAssembly. Like we're trying to find ways to maintain old client technologies in the modern world, and at the same time, we're waiting for this to come down the pipe. I even did shows on Flutter. I got phone calls for doing shows about Flutter. You know, why are you talking about a Google technology in a .NET show? It's because it's awesome, and Maui is late. <laughs> but uh, in the end, Maui offers an, uh, is a consolidation of all of the XAML experiments. You know, XAML fragmented inside of Microsoft with WPF and Silverlight and WinPhone, and there was a, the, the, what became UWP, which is actually a different implementation than what we were running over in .NET. And then you throw in Xamarin Forms on top of all of that, and they had to rationalize it all. And it, you know, you'll notice Miguel isn't at the company anymore. Like the rationalization was painful. But Maui is bringing all those pieces together to try and give us a coherent client story. The question is, why would you do this versus sticking with web? And, it's, and we get, we're going to talk about that because it's very interesting that there's so much interest on, the client, on client technologies. Containerization is going to continue to evolve. I sort of gave it away on the, on the WebAssembly part that that's an interesting kind of container. But in the end, we still have the same problem as developers, which is that we need to run software in the context of somebody else's machine where we don't know what else is running, and that machine comes in lots of different form factors. So the better we describe the requirements of our application, both what we need to operate on and what we're going to consume and communicate with, represents a security perimeter and a performance perimeter. That's really what containers are about, right? In traditional virtualization, you literally bundled the OS in. That seems dumb. So then we got to the Docker phase where it's like, okay, the OS is on the outside. Just tell us which one you want. But if you look at it from a WebAssembly perspective, it's even smaller again, which is like, here's, an op here's a sandbox you can live in and run certain kinds of code. What do you want to do? And if that's sufficient for you, it's a much smaller container, effectively. But containerization, the movement, continues because it addresses security and, and distributed computing problems. You know, okay, this phone can't handle this compute, so let's go run it on an edge device and, and just communicate down to the, to the phone. Like, those are all become possibilities that we don't have to code if we have containerization correct. And if all this freaks you out, then you're not alone. Look, there's more than one way to have a computing career. If you're working in a stack you really like and you're good at 
and you don't live for the next stack, you're, you're, you're happy where you are, you're not doomed. You're just gonna have a different kind of career. You're gonna be a specialist. And that means you focus on maintaining the feature set for your, the stack that you care about. I talk to folks who've been working in web forms since 2002. And they have a, you know, it's like I'm, I'm 10 years away from retirement. Do I really wanna retool in Maui? Like only if you want to, like it's a ride, but you got a lot of things to learn. If you've been doing web forms like it's 2005. But it's not like those web form apps are gonna go away. You know, what would, should you be working on? How do I make web forms work on a phone? It's possible, I've done shows on it, right? Like you can continue to specialize in a stack. Just recognize there's gonna be fewer opportunities, but those who need you really, really need you. Talk to a COBOL developer today, because the mainframes just don't seem to be turning off. And they're in their 60s, they've been paid more than ever before, like I'd be an idiot to retire right now, because there's nobody replacing them. So if you step off the new stack grind and onto a stack you're gonna care about, you can be that person, just don't stop learning. You still need to learn. You still need to work in the development environment that your company's gonna need and that will evolve, it's inevitable. And you need to be good at solving the problems around your stack. If you wanna jump on the new stack, that's great. I have advertisers who wanna to talk to you, and otherwise I have to get a real job. So listen to the shows, those are the shows we're making about the new stack. But we also made the shows about improving the old stacks, right? I did a show on web forms for phone development. It's doable. It's just a question of who you're gonna stay in, right? There's not one way to have a career. There are lots of choices. And even though we are going through one of the roughest patches for software developers these next couple of years that we'll have had for literally 20 years before, it's not that rough. The rest of the world's having a tougher time. You just gotta figure it out. I would mention the power platform briefly um, this is, I have seen this, this play before, right? History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And in the, in the middle 90s, a set of rad tools like Visual Basic and Access came along, Power Builder, and they really appealed to the domain expert, not the programmer. At the time, the programmer was a C++ developer working in MFC or ATL. And they mocked these tools mightily because a domain user, somebody who really knew a space, could sit down with these tools and get an 80% case done in a few days and ruin their career. It's like, you used to be a chemical engineer, then you automated a workflow, now you're just a bad programmer who knows something about chemical engineering, right? And the number of people in this room that's like, oh, geez, that's how I got my career, right? Like that happens. You had a domain expertise, you got enamored of automation and you did it. This is a new generation of that. This is table stakes or cross-platform, doesn't matter which device you're using, and backends on the cloud. Now, is there a role for, like, for a, a, don't mock it, we've all been there. And it's not like any of us were getting to the bottom of our to-do list. There's a whole lot of projects that can be lifted up with tools like this to a certain point. And the good news is for the most part, when they hit a wall, developers can step in and add the additional capabilities, right? You can build some APIs that they're not easily exposed or too complicated to use. You can build an additional UI component that they can branch out to. So they can take the drudge app work off you and you only work on the cool stuff, right? Now, if you're more in the management side, these guys need guardrails. They don't write a lot of tests. They don't know anything about source control. And, uh, and they don't know, they're not particularly concerned about security. Sound familiar? Right, like, like young developers everywhere. And so we do need to help them do the right thing with code our companies will ultimately depend on. And if you wanna try, change up a career completely, a programmer working in Power Platform, you will blow some minds. Like you can move fast, because you're not confused by a lot of stuff the domain experts are. All right, current stack, stack stuff done. Let's talk a little more futures. Let's talk about artificial intelligence. Now, I pull up a picture of Hal for a reason. The term artificial intelligence is old. It was coined in 1958, the Dartmouth University, when they, a group of scientists were trying to extract money from the US military to build smart technology. They succeeded to a degree, 
but that term was invented then. The first time the public generally heard it was in a movie from 1968 that Kubrick wrote alongside Arthur C. Clarke. The book actually comes out after the movie. They named it HAL, one letter off of IBM. They admit that was true. And of course, our relationship with artificial intelligence was cemented when the first time most people ever heard the term, it was for a computer that tried to kill everybody. So we set ourselves on the path, right? And then part, part of the problem you have with AI is that it's a blanket term, largely for stuff that doesn't work particularly well yet. Because once it does start to work, we give it a name, right? We break it out. So the umbrella term is AI, but and this, I love this diagram just because it, it starts things out so well. The shortest lines here, like that planning, scheduling, and optimization part, that was what, um, Minsky and their guys were working with in the 1950s that the US military got so much value from. Then in the 1970s, it's expert systems and robotics, and the lines just keep getting louder as we get better and better technology. The current revolution that we're enjoying in AI comes from about 2011 with the ImageNet competition and the adversarial network or the smart neural network that allows for image identification. It doesn't always go particularly well, but this is technology that can be incorporated into software today. It's quite reasonable to do that. That you can add, if you, image recognition is valuable to you, you know, you think through a workflow with a tablet. I talk to bankers now that are taking the tablets to the customer. The customer thinks it's a service, but in reality what they're doing is really assessing whether you can pay. And how your home looks and, your, and, and the things you own look tells a lot about your ability to pay, far more than any form you would ever fill in. And so using the software and the tablet to take pictures of things and have them automatically recognized and categorized makes them better bankers. In the end, they have fewer defaults on loans because they select folks more effectively by their ability to pay. And that brings us to the biggest part of the modern machine learning movement is in data analytics. So, the, we started out with good old fashioned reports and you still build a bunch of them, although I'm sure they're not as popular as they used to be. And then predictive analytics is sort of the mainstream approach today where we're starting to say, okay, if last month sold this much, what does next month look like? What does next year look like? Those kinds of things. And we have, these were originally all data mining functions. We'd run an OLAP services back in the 90s and 2000s if you had several million dollars to spend on gear. Today, this is a cloud service you can run for an hour against a data set, costs you less than 100 bucks. So you can experiment with data analytics in a way you've never been able to before. And if your company's not taking advantage of this, you're looking for a new opportunity, this is a huge space. But we can go further. As we start adding machine learning models in, now we're doing things like we're simply trying every model and then comparing them automatically. So instead of having to do a lot of planning, it's just brute force because we have so much compute available to us and the machine learning models are getting better. The hip term today is now what we call prescriptive analytics. And in prescriptive analytics, you're actually you're now picking, proposing an action against an entity and then assessing with predictive analytics what it would do. So, I mean, one hand is, the sales process. How often do you send someone an email about, I'm sure you're getting these right now, an abandoned cart in an e-commerce site. Hey, we noticed you put these things, th things in your cart. You know, if you order, you pick that up, maybe you just forgot about it, just wanted to let you know about it. Then the next email is, I'll give you 10% off one of them. Or how about free shipping, right? I mean, and that's all automated. There's no person sending you those emails, right? That's this prescriptive analytics play. Uh, and if you want to get away from the e-commerce marketing side of this, you get more into things like does it make more sense to evacuate a neighborhood for a forest fire, knowing that will kill a certain number of people of the stress of evacuating, or wait, right? We're getting better with software to know the right, to make it, if we evacuate them earlier, even though it'll cost a bunch of money, it's fewer risk of, uh, risk of life, right? The models are getting really good at figuring that stuff out. Same for flooding, or when do we start hitting, setting up cooling centers for heat waves? You notice I'm doing a lot of climate change stuff. I've been watching your news. You guys had a tough couple of years. In British Columbia, we went back to back with heat dome where the, we had one city that had the, uh, one town that had the highest temperature in Canada three days in a row and on the third day it burnt to the ground, followed by completely buried in forest fire smoke for a month. Then it rained so hard it washed out, washed out all of the highways and put a big chunk of farmland underwater. And at that point, we said like, what's next? The plague of frogs? <laughs> But yeah, we've all been having challenges with that. I actually looked at a, pre, a, a prescriptive analytics service uh, that was being used for when to replace a power generation turbine. 
So based on, and it's all of those different factors simultaneously. So what is the current power demand? Can we afford to have that turbine down? What's the likelihood of it failing inside of that window? What's the availability of the components to do the upgrade on it? You know, picking the right moment to order the parts, get everything organized, and actually take it down to do the work on it. Modern data analytics does a way better job of this. And so it's a growth area. It's a tremendous amount of work to be done there. Uh, AI and programming, well, you can make a video game by describing it in, in text, right? This is the OpenAI Codex project, so using GPT-3, or if you've gotten into GitHub Copilot, it's kind of looking like Stack Overflow on steroids. Basically, now I'm writing out phrases that just search for code for me written by other people. Um, there have been some great demos with this where a guy said, I don't know Rust, but I want to make a Hello World website with Rust and literally described that need to co-pilot it, gave them all the code to compile and run on Rust and boom, you had a hello world. They're all experiments, but it also speaks to a trend for us over the next few years. You know, I ask guys like Mads Torgensen, you know, the, the guy who's leading the C-sharp project right now, it's like, you never make backward compatibility. You've left all these features in C-sharp going back to the original, you're up to 11 now. You've got all better ways to do things. Like how are you gonna convince us to do it the new way? It's like, it's about the tooling. So can we get to a point where there's machine learning models smart enough to look at your code and say, hey, you're kind of programming this in a C-sharp 6 style. Let me show you refactoring in C-sharp 11. Yeah, okay, apply that. And so help you learn the new versions, right? AI is not going to replace us as programmers. It has no autonomy. Yeah, I know Google had their, we have a sentient computer thing. Pretty sure that's not true. Uh, but, you know, we're, we are finding, we are good at building tools, that's what humans do. The straight path between the stick for pulling ants out of the ground and Copilot, right? These are tools that allow us to extend our own creativity, efforts, and needs into our current workspace. They're just continuing. One last thing before we're out of time here, and that is what replaces the smartphone? Smartphone is pretty much mature, right? It gets bigger, it gets smaller, it has one camera, it has two cameras, it has three cameras, it has an IR camera, whatever. They're all more or less the same. We've kind of hit the wall on it. What's the logical next step? And most likely it is the visor of some kind. This is a mock of supposedly what Apple's going to present us with in the next year or two. Uh, it'll be tethered to the phone, so the phone will still be the compute device. The watch may or may not exist. This is a mock-up, it's not real. But the bottom line is, Having information directed directly into your eyes and having a camera on your head seems to be the logical path. Yeah, nobody wants to be a glass, okay? I have a Google Glass. I have worn the Google Glass. I mean, not recently, but when I first started wearing the Google Glass out, I had exactly the same experience I had when I first had a smartphone, which the people see it and go, can I try it? Then when they try it and it's not good, enough, then they make fun of it. Right? But remember what happened when you got a smartphone, nobody else had a smartphone, and somebody said, can I try it? And then you couldn't get it back from them. And that's what's going to happen with augmented reality devices once they get to that point. They'll be good enough, and you won't, don't give it to anybody because they're gonna take it, right? They, they will be profound. Now, again, his, you know, the future's not evenly distributed. We do have Google Glass. That's a real uh, product you can buy today from Qualcomm. It's called the XR1, again, with the Android device on the outside. Um, this is a more Toshiba's version of this, more industrial. So the camera and so forth just over one particular eye. And of course, we've got HoloLens. This is the Trimble XR10, which is actually integrated with your hard hat because it's designed for construction or working in industrial plants. And this is a field unit. They're about $5,000 a shot. I look at augmented reality at this moment where we're seeing workers use them to do complex tasks. So they have to do a maintenance on a jet turbine or on a, on a machine, and instead of looking through the book or you know, looking to a tablet, they literally have their checklist in front of their eyes. In fact, the best ones won't show them the next item until it's analyzed that you finished the previous item. Remove this screw, and then it's watching you remove the screw. In fact, the video record of all of the work is an important part of the equation. And when you hit a point where you need an assessment by an expert, you then request that expert who's somewhere else on the facility, they put their glasses on and now are looking through your camera at the same thing you're looking at and give you that information. And that's also recorded as part of the path. So Pratt & Whitney's C-class teardown of jet, of jet turbines, that's a $50 million jet turbine doing a $5 million service. 
it takes about a month to do all the work on that turbines before it goes back on an airplane now on, on and every part has to be authenticated that it's a, or the real part and that all the steps were followed correctly. And so the fact that they've bought a bunch of $5,000 headsets and run about $1,000 a month per headset in back-end services makes total sense for them. It's a multi-million dollar product. It's not for everyone. This reminds me of the BlackBerry in 1998. Right back in the West Wing era when they called it a Crackberry, because back then they were about a thousand bucks, and they were the only phone that had email on them, and you had to run a customized version of Exchange on the back end with the BlackBerry Exchange management system, and it cost a lot of money and took a lot of people to run. But if you needed certain people to have email on their phone at all time, it was a breakthrough, and then it got commercial. It got turned into a consumer product with the iPhone. But even the iPhone took a few years to get it right. The hardware problem is substantial. HoloLens is stuck to their guns on putting everything on the visor where most production units you're looking at right now are tethered. They have, a, they have a glasses on with a cable running to a pouch on your back with a phone with an extra battery on it because this thing mows through battery power. But we didn't see the HoloLens 3. This is the HoloLens 2, which is circa 2017. The 3 was originally developed for the US military and then they changed a bunch of the rules so they scrapped it at the prototype stage. So we are two TikTok Intel cycles behind on augmented reality headsets. We had, can't, and that means one of two things. We're either cutting the price in a quarter for the same hardware, or we're adding a bunch of additional advancements and keeping it relatively expensive, so, or some balance in between. We're very close. And this is where we get into that whole conversation about client stacks, because web ain't gonna cut it in this thing. Now this is normal when we have a major change in form factor or devices that we have to go fairly native. The main way that folks are programming a HoloLens right now is Unity. So keep your C-sharp skills sharp if you wanna play in this field, but also a lot of 3D learning and a lot of ways of thinking about it. I've seen some demonstrations of the HoloLens of coding in the HoloLens where the guy's typing on a keyboard blind because he's looking through the visor at the space that he's working in, but he's creating objects and looking at the code through the visor, which is cool. It's very matrixy, but you know, we don't know what that'll look like yet. That's a, that's a progression that's ongoing. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Meta. Apparently Zuckerberg's capable of burning through $10 billion in less than two years because they're now having cutbacks and laying people off. They were paying basically top dollar for anybody who wanted to work on it. I know some really great people who went over to Facebook to work on. It's actually called Horizon World. The reality, of course, is that Facebook has such a reputation that most other companies that want to do something in this metaverse space are staying very hush-hush, including Microsoft, because they don't want to be contaminated with the fallout of what Facebook's doing. I mean, if you think about what Facebook's trying to do in virtual reality, they're trying to recreate Second Life as a, uh, a product for advertisers, because that's all what they know how to do. They know how to build a social media site. You're trying to build something out of nothing, effectively. It's not a particularly good strategy. All right, last couple of minutes. Let's talk a little quantum computing because it's been getting hot around there. Uh, first off, you hear all the news about quantum computing will destroy encryption. Don't worry about that. There's two reasons. One is the encryption problem is extremely hard for quantum computers to solve. They will solve it eventually, but many more things will happen before that happens. And second is we are perfectly capable of building encryption. It's not dependent on prime numbers, which is why quantum computers can break it. We just haven't needed to change it. The moment we decide we do need to change it, we will. It'll be TLS 3.5 and it'll use ladder-based encryption, which is not as computationally efficient as RSA encryption, but does not susceptible what quantum computers do. Quantum computers are a very difficult problem. In order to have functional qubits in the current state of technology, you have to cool semiconductors down with liquid helium, which means running somewhere around one to two degrees Kelvin, colder than space. And then you also have to get information from it, which means putting energy into it, which usually screws that up. So you've got this duality problem where you need it very cold and stable, but you're still trying to read information from it, typically through magnetic fields. There's been a bunch of progress on that area. So the Sycamore, which is Google's current one, in 2019 had 54 qubits, although the test was only 53 qubits because one of the qubits was broken. But they did a, a test using a random number problem that's specific to quantum. And the run was about 200 seconds. 
and prove that it was a, a quantum problem. And they initially said, this will take 10,000 years of a conventional computer. IBM, their rival, then did the problem in a day and a half with a conventional computer, but not 200 seconds. So I think we'll leave the quantum supremacy like they've finally done something that fast with quantum, good enough. The Chinese with the Zhejiang photonic quantum computer, completely different design, not even remotely similar to the Fermion design that, that, that Google used. Uh, in 2020, they got up to 113 entangled qubits. They did uh, a boson sampling quantum problem. Again, about a 200 second run current estimate to do that with classical computers would be about two and a half billion years. I'm sure IBM can improve on that by down to, I don't know, 100 million years, but we would take a while to find that out. IBM's latest, this is the Eagle, 127 tangled qubits. Using the Transmon architecture, totally different approach again. And uh, they, they have, are currently doing testing on it. We haven't gotten good results yet. They swear by the end of this year, they'll have a 433 qubit computer. When is this gonna do anything useful? Because right now you're doing random number problems and Boson assembly problems, whatever. So let me talk to you about a useful problem we have today that we feel could only be cracked with quantum computers. And it's in agriculture. Now today in modern agriculture, we know that if you plant wheat in the ground and you harvest it, the next year if you plant wheat again, the wheat is smaller because you've taken a bunch of nutrients out of the soil. And we fix that by adding fertilizers to the soil. And we use a thing called the Haber-Bosch process. It was developed in World War I. It happens to also make explosives, because that's life for you. Could be explosives, could be fertilizer to save the world. Uh, that now consumes about 1% of all the energy that humans produce to make fertilizer for food. Um, to put those nutrients back in the soil. And yet we knew, before we knew how to make fertilizer, that you could rotate crops. That if you plant wheat one year, and then next year you plant beans, the beans, the roots on the beans, actually when you plow them under and let them sit for a year to rot, put refertilize the soil, crop rotation. And we've studied the bean plant to say, how does the bean plant do this little trick? And it has a rhizome that grows on the roots in little cysts, and inside of it is an enzyme called nitrogenase. And nitrogenase, makes fertilizer. It takes water out of the air and nitrogen out of the air and combines it into ammonia. At plant energy levels, we have these huge factories for making fertilizer and plants have been doing it for millions of years. Now we have studied this for a hundred years and know that it is a catalytic reaction between iron and molybdenum that somehow combines the nitrogen and, and hydrogen together. We just don't know how it works. There's about 170 electrons involved in the catalytic reaction. And to compute all the variations of how those electrons would interact is more compute power than we have on the planet. But a 250 qubit computer should knock it out in about five minutes. Now, what would that mean for society if we were actually able to do that? Well, it would mean, A, we would stop making fertilizer at such huge scale. This is a low energy way to make it. Now, just because we know what the catalytic reaction is doesn't mean we necessarily know how to recreate it. So there's plenty of engineering work to be done. But you can imagine being able to make fertilizer in situ, like a little stake with a watch battery on it that you stick in the ground beside your plant and it monitors how much fertilizer is available to the plant or how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium is available to your plant and then pulls it out of the atmosphere and puts it in the soil on demand. So less problems with fertilizer runoff, far less energy consumption. Like, it's a green revolution if we knock it out. That's one quantum chemistry problem. There's about 300 known ones that are all sitting waiting for a quantum computer somewhere between two and 500 qubits to make it work. Batteries are essentially alchemy. We just try different combinations to see if we get a good one. We do not understand the interaction of how batteries actually work. It's too complex. Quantum computing can help us in this space. It would mean a substantial jump in the possibility of power storage. Superconductors. We kind of understand what's going on in superconductors now. We start to call it a phase of matter. We've had an accidental improvement in Rebco uh, superconductors back in the 80s. We still don't really understand how it works. Quantum computers can solve that one. Here's the problem with all these very cool problems. Once you crack them, you've cracked them. They're deterministic problems. So how many quantum computers do you need if this is the class of problem you have? And that reminds me of Thomas Watson and IBM back in the day who said, yeah, we think there's a market for like five computers. Well, A, it's a totally apocryphal statement. He didn't actually say that. And B, he was clearly wrong. But why did he say it? Well, at the time, this is what computers looked like. 
right? They were bespoke machines. You built them specific into a building, came with a bunch of guys in lab coats. They had names, right? They were not like computers you think of today. They also hadn't figured out the bit yet. They were doing bits with vacuum tubes and relays. They were, it took a while before they finally got to the silicon bit, right? That ultimately was manifest with Intel. And the, the person that, that um, Moore and all those guys that became Intel, they originally worked for a company called Fairchild Semiconductor. And the, f the fellow there was a guy named Shockley, apparently an unpleasant person, but also one of the guys who helped invent the transistor at Bell Labs. And he was the one who came up with the original concept of the integrated circuit, of using layers of silicon, with doped with different substrates, with boron and phosphorus stacked together to make these tiny transistors that's responsible for all of our jobs. In Shockley's own notes, as he was learning, he was exploring the idea of making the semiconductor this way, he used a mechanical computer of the day to compute the model, to be able to actually understand how he would, that phosphorus was the correct element to use for doping for P-type silicon substrates. I think that's where we are with quantum computer. It rhymes for me in history, that these current bespoke, unstable, expensive, unique, individually named quantum computers are going to be sufficiently powerful for, for us to actually figure out what the correct qubit should be, what the modern quantum transistor will ultimately look like, and then they transform. You can't look at this and think of this, right? There's no path from this kind of mainframe to playing Candy Crush. So I don't know what's going, what quantum computers will ultimately mean for us. But I do know in the next 10 years, quantum computing will start having an impact on civilization. It'll start solving certain classes of problems and one of them will be building better computers with it in general. And so if we think beyond that time space, what's next? Here's the best part of our job. We get to choose. This is our industry. We help make all these things come true. You wanna know what's gonna happen next in the future? Make it, it's up to us. Thanks for your time and have a great show.